Welcome to the Izzy Chinche Show. My entire business is built on authenticity. I am 100% myself on every channel, in every capacity, and I don't filter myself at all. I am 100% authentic. I'm so excited you're able to tune in. Join me as I interview athletes, entrepreneurs, and high achievers. I also share much about my life struggles, trials, and successes in hopes to inspire you. I intend for this show to be one of the greatest shows of all time, so your listening and support means the most to me. My goal is to help inspire as many people as possible, so please share with a friend if you enjoy just one thing from today's episode. Together, we can help more people grow. Let's get started. All right. Welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here. Thank Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Yes, this is going to be really fun. Do you want to start with giving a little intro on you and what you do, and then we'll go from there? Sure. I'm Leslie Lyon. I own uh, Leslie M. Lyon Digital Marketing Agency, and we elevate brands. Yes, including my brand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> including the <laughs> brand that I've done. Yes. <laughs> I love okay. Your- yes. Okay. Can you share the story of how you entered the marketing and branding industry and what inspired you to start your own business? I know you've had multiple businesses, but let's start with this business. <laughs> sure. Actually, this was my original business idea seven years ago Ooh. when I left a difficult marriage and I really wanted to launch it then, but I, my life took a different turn and I ended up launching a different business then. So when I was regrouping after that business, this business circled back around and it just kind of, honestly, it was born of its own accord just from my past experiences, the connections I had, and it was definitely something that I loved and enjoyed. And at that point in my life, I was only choosing hell yes opportunities and it was my only hell yes I love that. I love that. What's been your favorite part about this, the whole experience and in branding and like even the evolution of your own brands and then working with other people brands? Like what's the part that you like the most about it? I would have to say, first off, I love younger generations. I have a lot of children, as you are well aware of, and (laughs) something about their excitement their ability to see beyond difficulty and their willingness to jump in and try new things is something Mm -hmm. that I love. So I love working with younger entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs that are just getting into this space. Um, Yeah. Good. No, I love that. You've definitely, definitely helped me a lot in this, in this seven years from when you like first had this idea, um, and then you ended up jumping into your other business. Do you think that that was also kind of crucial to like teach you a lot that now helps you in what you're doing now and like understanding the business side or you're like, hey, I don't know. <laughs> How do you feel no. about that? And in actuality, when I circled back on this business, I looked at the four businesses I did between my first business and this business and the parts that I loved we're all about marketing, lead generation, and branding. And they like every part of that excites me, makes me happy, makes me want to yeah. show up to work every day. I, it's not a job for me. I literally love it. I live yeah. it. I breathe it. And I think it is the best thing ever. And I can't, I can't help but sell it because I love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait, could you go over the other four businesses really quick? Because I love to yeah. hear about this. Yeah. So when I left my marriage, I had three business models that I wanted to try. And I've always been entrepreneurial. When I was still in my marriage, we had a business together that I didn't love, but I kind of cut my teeth on all the things there. And I had this thought pattern while I was leaving. If I can make something I don't like successful, imagine what I could do if I did something that I loved. So when I left, I had the opportunity to look at these three business models. And I wasn't sure which one to choose or how to go about it. And then one night I dreamt the business model, the logo, the tagline, the trailer, and it was a mobile bar business. And this is pretty hysterical because I don't even drink. (laughs) 
Yeah. And at that point, I wasn't convinced I believed in marriage. So it was kind of funny yeah. because we worked a ton of weddings. But the <laughs> next, yeah, the next day after I had the dream, I went and bought the trailer. I had the logo built. I started the website. I did everything within the first week. And I called it a side hustle because at that point I was yeah. needing to focus on, I was in school full time for my psychology degree. I worked That's part -time. right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah, I worked part time and I still had three kids at home that were going through the adjustment of us being divorced. So I just wanted to do this as a side hustle and it exploded. And within six months, I had to quit school. I had to quit my job and I focused on it full time. And it was amazing. And I learned so much about systems, about marketing, about how to appeal to my ideal client, which was very, very high end because I didn't want to work a weekend that didn't make me some serious bank. And pretty soon I had two or three events going every weekend and I had a full support staff and I systematically pulled myself out of the mix so that I didn't overwork myself. Still wasn't very good at that, but it was my goal to get as far out of it as I could because it's my theory. If you can't take your hands off of it, it's not a viable business. I love that. Yeah, I love that. And, but but now it's funny that you're so hands in your business, but that's like probably that alignment piece. You know what I'm saying? Like you said that and I'm like, but now you're loving what you're doing. So you want to be in it. Exactly. And each business has its own DNA creation around it. And at that point, because I was so new in business, especially with an alcohol business, I was having to do a lot of studying because I didn't drink. And so there was some aspects of it that didn't align for me, but I got to test all of my entrepreneurial theories on it. Because if you don't totally know the business framework or some aspects of the business, it forces you to level up. And yeah. so I was a lot of studying to become the expert in that field. And it it's not rocket science. Selling alcohol yeah. and serving booze is not rocket science. The marketing and the lead gen behind it is where I excelled. And that's why it was so successful. And it was also adorable. People loved it. So cute. So, so cute. Uh, how, how far into school were you before you're like, okay, I obviously don't need a degree to make a lot of money and to be doing <laughs> own thing. Like how, how did that go? Tell me about that a little bit. <laughs> so that's an interesting story because I really wanted to be a counselor and a psychologist and help people because I came out of a high control religion and an abusive relationship. And I yeah. felt like that was my life's mission. Turns out it was just me healing myself. And I got in about 18 months and they started oh, wow. in yeah, they started introducing all the rules and regulations that you have to follow as a counselor. And I was like, um, no, thank you. Honestly, because of how I chose to heal, it was a little bit more out of the box than what a traditional therapist would be, quote unquote, allowed to do. And yeah, I was making so You're much like, money. I can't subscribe shrooms. I don't understand. <laughs> exactly. 100%. I healed my entire life using mushrooms and MDMA. Yeah. So there was no way I was going to go into a counseling environment and not tell them what worked for me. And that yeah. would have impacted my legalities of being able to be ethically employed. And I was yeah. making a ton of money doing what I was doing. So I was like, why am I here? And I had healed the aspects of myself that really yeah. needed that in that environment. So it turns out that was just uh, counseling for me and I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And probably like the same price point too, or similar. <laughs> probably, and I got to drive the train, which is really my preferred yeah. avenue. Yeah, do you feel, do you still feel like you learned a lot from that? Like actually in the classrooms or, or not? Or yeah, you did? Honestly, or? it was pivotal for me. My first okay. Psych 101 class, they were sitting there and they were discussing childhood memories. And this, yeah. this is two weeks into my degree. This is brand new, fresh on the train. And they were discussing childhood memories. And all these people were talking about having memories at one, two, three years old. And I was like, uh, what? 
I was scrolling through the Rolodex in my own memories and realizing I didn't have any memories before eight or 10. And I was like, what's that about? And that's where I started researching how to call forward repressed memories and where psilocybin came in. Wow. That's, I, I actually really love to hear that because I feel there's some people who are like, oh, I started school, but, you know, I didn't finish it. But I'm like, yeah, but did you get anything out of it? And a lot of time it's like, yeah, either I learned that's, I definitely don't want to go down that path or learn something like you that put them down a whole other path. Yeah. Yeah. And the other aspect of it was that it was just really good for me to have something consistent to focus on at that time in my life, because I had been in a very controlling relationship. I didn't get to make a lot of choices for myself. So it was kind of like I was coming from a place of a more childlike experience, even though I was 42 when I started school. And it's it's not something I need to go back and finish. I got everything that I needed out of it. And I yeah. also got to experience um, a very different viewpoint because the school system is quite liberal. And it was very eye-opening to me in a lot of beautiful ways. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad. I haven't really asked about that. So I'm, I'm happy to learn about that. Okay, so then after Tipsy, tell me a little bit about that, where you headed after that. So Tipsy Exploded was doing amazing. I was about to triple the size of the business and COVID hit and it shut me down. But because there was no assistant for self-employed people, I kept doing events because I'm in an area that is a little bit rogue where rules are concerned. So they just kept having weddings and I serviced them. And about halfway through COVID, it just it was too much for me and my staff. The people didn't listen. The drinking was out of hand. The uh, rebelliousness was out of hand. And I was like, we can't, we can't do these events anymore. So then we went ahead and shut it all the way down at that point. And so when we came out of COVID, I just started to rebuild as you naturally would when you own a business. Obviously, there was an interim period where I needed income. Yeah. And so I launched, um, when I started Tipsy, we, I was one of the first 100 people in the nation that started mobile bars. So I was a part of a community that was leaders in that. And there was a lot of people during COVID looking to get going in that. So I started coaching other business owners how to scale and how to build their business in the mobile bar world. And it, I got so many opportunities to work with people who really liked this business model. And then after that, I started plugging in people into Tipsy to take over my position. And I launched a virtual assistant sourcing company. We specialized in placements from Latin America because they're on the same time zone as us. And there was a lot of English speaking ones. And we just did, uh, I set up the whole systems where they could apply, take their English literacy test and do a couple of other profile tests. And then we set up a whole system for business owners to choose their VA. And I got a lot of fulfillment out of that. But what I learned is that most business owners do not have any systems in place with which to train their virtual assistants. This is true. Wow. Yeah. That ended up being a lot of legwork on my side. Had I had more um, finances or banking, I could have set up an entire software for training and all those things. At this point, I was running three businesses, COVID had ended, and I'd hit max capacity of what I could do efficiently. And so I started cutting things and that was the first to go. Okay. So then I was just doing tipsy and coaching, which I determined that I really loved coaching. I didn't necessarily love doing it for mobile bar owners, just a very different, I wanted to venture out into that. So I expanded my coaching, which included some more esoteric elements that involved healing and was more in line with a therapeutic type of experience. So that is where I found a lot of fulfillment and enjoyment. And it, I'm still doing that today. I still love that very much. Yeah. Yeah. No, you you helped me with stuff. I love it. (laughs) You're, you are naturally that healing energy. Mm -hmm. That's very, very, very much you. 
And I like that you said that you love coaching because I feel like even within Elevate, you you do coach. Even when, if you know, if we have a meeting about something, you're also coaching me through something like, all right, you know, you got to do this and this. And that's kind of kind of your style. And I love the way that that's that's played out. OK, so then from that timeline, then when did you uh, launch Elevate? So. When I closed, I was just doing coaching and tipsy and I had determined I wasn't aligned with tipsy anymore and I thought I would sell it. And mm -hmm. the timeline for me to sell it and the burnout I was headed for did not align. So I ended up closing it, which took an extremely large amount of bandwidth from all the events we had on the books, employees, selling assets, determining what was next. And I got about that close to a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so I moved to two states away and I basically didn't do anything but my coaching and I hid in the woods and I healed and I decided what was in alignment for me. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, Elevate was born kind of by accident. I had a lot of connections in the business world and a gentleman had reached out to me because he needed a virtual assistant, knew that's what I did. I took a look at his business model and I decided I wanted to do it and I was going to blow it up for him. And so I pitched oh. myself to him and I pitched what we would do and my price point. And he was a real estate agent. So uh, he had just left his extremely successful brokerage to go out on his own again. And I knew he and I together would be amazing. And so that was my first client. I worked yeah. with him solely for about six weeks. And then about every four weeks after that, I booked another client. And pretty soon I was like, oh, I guess I'm doing this. I love it. Yeah, I love it. And because you're passionate about it, it's going to be easier to attract that. <laughs> yeah, be easier. I've never had I've never had any trouble attracting ideal clients. And in all mm -hmm. honesty, I attract people who are quite passionate, tend to overwork and they need more systems in place and that yeah. is my genius zone along with blowing them up in their marketing. Yeah, wait. So why do you think um, why do you think you do attract those kind of people? I think that's because of who I am. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think so my entire, my entire business is built on authenticity. I am 100% myself on every channel in every capacity. And I don't, I don't filter myself at all. I am 100% authentic and people, it's funny because some people really love that and some people get triggered by yeah. it. And I'm here for both. I like <laughs> both. I love that. I think that's something that's so hard for most people to show yeah. up as themselves and, and on media. And like you said, you, you do it on, in all, in all spaces in your business, on media and your platforms, like um, when do you think, have you always been that way? Do you feel like you've never had a problem? You're always going to be like, screw you. I'm going to be myself. Or when did that kind of come about? That definitely. So entrepreneurship for me was the rise from victim to survivor. Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is less about making money for me and more about being in alignment and in my power. That mm -hmm. is the catalyst with which I chose to rise from victimhood to survivor. So for me, once I was no longer a victim, there was nothing else that I saw but being authentic. At times, that authenticity was very raw and vulnerable. And there were times in my evolution where I shared a lot about my past abuse. And I wouldn't change any of that because on my platform, I talk a lot about domestic violence, high control religion, rising from victim to survivor. And that's just me. My niche mm -hmm. is my authenticity is 100%. So it evolves with me. And there are times when I hit certain things that people are like, what does this have to do with marketing? It doesn't have anything to do with marketing. This is just me. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I love that. And I, I think people can be encouraged by hearing that. And 
I, well, I get caught up in that too. Like, oh, should I post that? Should I like? Do I want to? I'm like, yeah. Like, I took an ice bath yesterday and put my sunglasses on, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna post that. <laughs> be myself like does that have anything to do with soccer and like getting recruited no but <laughs> it's me and it's what I'm doing so you've inspired me in that space and what would you tell someone who feels like I just don't know how to put myself out there I just can't do it I can't because I talk to people who are like this who say like I just I can't do it like it, it gives them like the cringe to think about it like what would be kind of like your hype there like do this and it'll help or something mm -hmm. There have been back. moments. There have been moments where I have struggled with that. Less so. First off, something happens around when you're 40 and you quit giving a fuck about <laughs> what others think. So some of it comes with age, but some of it comes with just being more confident with yourself and with what you bring to the table. If you truly believe that who you are as a human helps other people. There's mm -hmm. less thoughts about that. What are people going to think of me? How is this going to come off? And you know what? What I have found is that people struggle the most with their family and close people to them. And so sometimes if I'm struggling, what I do is I visualize my ideal client and I speak directly to them. Sometimes my ideal client is me. Oh, I love that. So, I you know it's. There's a lot of psychology behind being unconfident or not being willing to be authentic online. And it's something that can't have just a patent answer. It's something you kind of want to look yep. at and dig into. And this is where the aspect of me comes in that really is a healer and a therapist at heart. There's something in your programming preventing you from being your true authentic self. It's going to affect every relationship in your life, including your business. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I had someone tell me the other day, they're like, well, I just, I don't want to start posting that because it's like all my close friends and family on my, on that account, everyone that I know. And I'm like, so you don't want them to know like where you actually stand with everything? Like, you know, I didn't say it like that, but I was, you know, I was trying to kind of ask that question. Like, do you, do it's you realize that? Like, normal. maybe you don't have the right people. Yeah. Well, and it's a super normal feeling. And one thing that I think works to my advantage is having left a high control religion and an abusive relationship. I still have a lot of friends and family that are still in a very religious mindset. They're still... Mm -hmm on my social media, they're still watching me. And I feel like um, I have had so many people reach out to me behind the scenes and say, this is so inspirational. I had no idea you went through that. I can't mm -hmm. believe that happened to you. This gives me hope. Or they share their personal story with me. That's not why I do it. But those are added bonuses. And if you can cut out the thought patterns from your past or from your family or from close friends, you probably don't have really great friends or family. And that is okay. Like I accepted a long time ago. I don't align with those people in my life. They're not my clients. They're not my customers. They don't support me daily. They can watch me. Yeah. <laughs> they can watch me and, and wish that they had the balls to put themselves out there. Like I do. <laughs> I'm just going to be a hundred percent me. And if they fall off, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. Okay. Next question. How do you balance the demands of entrepreneurship with your personal life? And what strategies have you found effective in maintaining that balance? In the past, <laughs> I had zero balance. And that's, that's always going to be something that I struggle with because I am such a worker and such a get shit done kind of girl. And I really love that about myself. So I have like my five core things that I go back to if I get tired or I'm feeling overwhelmed. When I get overwhelmed, I have some distinct things that happen. I can feel myself drop vibrationally and I start to worry more about what people think, what I'm doing, what are people going to say about that? That's a key indicator that something's off in my alignment and I need to come back and look at my five things. And that's my relationship with myself and my body, my relationship with my close people, 
my business. And then there's a couple key other aspect ones that I'm not calling at the moment, but I come back to those and I look at each one and I determine which area I'm not showing up for myself in. And it's usually mm. very, very simple. And for me, it's like, I have to get outside every day. I need to eat two, two times a day minimum. For whatever reason, those are the two things that go out the window when I am on a mission. And I just, if I come right back to them, I'm good to go. Yeah, no, I love that. Two, only two times a day though, because wow, I need to eat like 18 times a day to be well. Well, ideally I would eat more, but that is not, that's just something that I am not yeah. good at. We each have our own things that we're not good yeah. at. That's just mine. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I have things like that too, where I, I push it. I used to cut out sleep more than anything. And that obviously was very detrimental and like probably the worst thing that I could have cut out. And now the, the culture, like the grind entrepreneur culture, like sometimes like, oh, sleep when I'm dead. Like, you know, and, and I'm just like, dude, if I don't sleep, I tank in like all, yeah. all areas. So, yeah. Well, I, think, I mean, I think the biggest, I'm not a hustle, hustle culture girl at all, but I get a lot done because I yeah. do prioritize my sleep. I do prioritize outside time mm -hmm. and everybody's different what they need. But I spent the six years that I was doing tipsy and the never ending divorce I had sleeping four to five hours a night. And I tanked my adrenals. I, my body went into shutdown, my liver shut down. So if you're not protecting your boundaries, your body's going to show you what's, what you get. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, how is your sleep now? I know you get up early sometimes, but are you sleeping more hours than that now? <laughs> so my goal is to sleep, um, eight to 10. I usually get six to eight consistently. It just depends. Cause I'm still, I still have adrenal fatigue. So yeah. I have to be very careful and I have to watch it takes, it takes about however long it took you to get to adrenal fatigue. It takes you that long to heal it. Wow. So it's a, it's a slow process and it's something I have to be very mindful of. And yeah. it's just like, my body is like, nope, we're not doing that. And so I just have to listen to it. Yeah. I, I never went in and actually got tested and all that. I think that may have happened to me as well because I, I did years of that and I just pushed through and was like, oh, I need to be up at 4 a.m. working out for no reason, no reason that I needed to be like, I need to be up at that time and like throwing all these things. I felt unwell unless I was like almost drowning. I was so busy. And I think that takes a huge toll, if, for especially when you do that for a couple of years. That's definitely not um yeah, Doesn't well, and that is very much living in our masculine energy, which we both have both of, and our culture is very geared towards masculinity, which I mm -hmm. love the masculine, but I am in a feminine body and my body requires certain things to be healthy and my longevity is equally as important to me as my success. So I'm going to show up better for that aspect of myself that needs more sleep, needs more consistent food, mm -hmm. needs more fun. I think the feminine and the masculine, we need to have way more fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually really agree. I literally just saw uh, something that was just like a, a bunch of statistics on like why the happiness level is going down. It's like people aren't connecting as much. They're not having as much sex. Like they're, they're separating themselves with others. They're, they don't prioritize fun. And Fun used to be way more prioritized, especially like just even tribes getting together and dancing around like the fire and stuff like that was seriously like prioritized. And we're kind of like that hustle culture, I feel like is I've been in it, so I understand it, <laughs> but it can be kind of detrimental. Um, when you're talking about the masculine and the feminine energy, can you expand on that a little bit for someone who maybe hasn't heard anything about that? It's kind of like, all right, what? are the differences and what does that practically look like? So within each of us is a masculine presenting and a feminine presenting side and they work together. And a lot of people in the spiritual community teach that you need your counterpart. If you're a feminine presenting, you need a masculine presenting. That is not true. It is within you and the balance is created within yourself. So if you're in a patriarchal society that is geared much towards 
honoring the masculine presenting side of things, which is the get shit done, the, the strength, the hustle, all those things. That's going to be where your focus is because that's where, what you've been programmed for. And we've all been programmed for it. So if you're curious, mm -hmm. if you're programmed that way, you are. Everyone is. So for both men and women, really embracing the feminine presenting sides, which can be a lot of the attributes of the masculine, they just show up very differently. It's a mm -hmm. much more nurturing presence. They also have mad hustle, but they go about it differently. They mm -hmm. are they are a softer approach, dance. You know, um, I'm drawing a blank on some of the things that the that the feminine really excels at. But just so even the way we're connecting right now, we're both really in our feminine. We're really open with each other. We are softer than we might be if we were doing a sales call. Like when I'm, <laughs> when I'm in my sales mode, I tend to be a little bit more masculine. And I have to check that sometimes because I do attract a lot of feminine entrepreneurs, which I love them. But, and this is where you're reading your client, but for your aspect on your own side, the masculine feminine parts of you, you don't need an outside person to complete you. You have both of those within yourself and balancing them to the best of your ability. Like for me, if I feel my vibration drop and I start to get worried about what people are gonna think or I'm wasting brain space on shit that's not aligned for me, I know that I need to put on my bad bitch playlist and jam the fuck out. I love that. Also, I forget that you even ever think about what people think of you. I'm human. I'm human. <laughs> but I forget. I forget, though. I'm like, it's no. It's not rare for me anymore, but it does still happen on occasionally. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay. All right. Moving on to the next question. Okay. What advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs looking to enter the marketing and branding industry? So someone who's like, ooh, I, this kind of sounds like in alignment with me. You know, I like doing these kind of things. What advice would you give them? Um, the more mistakes you make, the more opportunities for success you have. Mm. So the more mistakes, the more learning, the more gaining, the more you study, the more you try things, the more you do things. For me, when I'm testing things, I'm testing them on my business and then I test them on my clients. I don't know my clients first, unless it's an avenue that I can't test on my business. So if you're getting into it, this is your time to take in a bunch of data, discern which, because marketing is huge. Like the amount of things that I offer that mm -hmm. is a huge menu. Pick the one thing that you want to hit. A lot of people in marketing will start with social media management. Pick that one mm -hmm. thing, get really good at it, find your clients. You only need three clients at a thousand bucks a month to replace your shitty minimum wage job. Three clients. I can manage that in my sleep. <laughs> yeah. You only need three. And get yeah. really good at it. Ask people in the business. Do not be afraid to pay for education. Do not be afraid to ask me. I've been around for a long time. If I don't know, I have the connections that do know. Like try new things, learn, take risks. My risk tolerance used to be really high. And I used to try crazy things and spend a shit ton of money and do all this stuff because I could. Now yeah. I'm much calmer, much more confident. I don't need to try a bunch of things and I've got like my standard things that I'm always learning. The one thing about marketing, if you're gonna go into this, you better have the capacity to take in a lot of data, discern what matters and mm -hmm. fit it into your program. Wow, that's so good. I, I love what you said about three clients, replace your minimum, like, I mean, even a low paying corporate job, I mean, ser I, seriously, like that replaces it. And I've talked, I've talked to someone who said like, oh, I really want to start my own thing. That was like a year ago. And I was like, okay, we'll just start with getting a client. And you know, a year later, still haven't done it. It's like, it's actually not that much. Just replace what you have and then, and then drive for it. I mean, that's exactly what I did. I was like, exactly. how can I replace the income <laughs> and then go from there? When I moved two states away to hide in the woods, told myself I didn't ever want to be an entrepreneur again, I went 
I went and worked at a bar because I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to sell anything. And mm -hmm. I picked up my first client, picked up my second client. Within three months, I was doing $5,000 a month and I was still bartending. And I was like, I don't really have to do this anymore. And <laughs> So I got rid of it. You know, it doesn't take a lot. And also, if you're getting into this business and you're doing social media management, do not charge less than a thousand dollars. Do mm. not. It's worth it. It's a lot of behind the scenes work. As long as you feel confident, you can deliver. Yeah, that's good. and and you can. All right. So let's talk a little bit about like. Um, if there's someone listening who wants to help with like their personal branding and and stuff like that, what you can help them with, and then how they would how they would connect with you in that space. Yeah, like I said, our menu of items is extensive. <laughs> so um, I always suggest starting with a brand kit if you're just getting going. If you have your socials launched and things like that, we can optimize and help you do a strategy. If you don't have a website. That's a great place to start. If you'd have nowhere for your leads to go, that's a huge thing to discuss. A lot of people think they're good at following up with leads, but they are not, I guarantee you. So that is a huge component. There's really nothing in the digital sphere that we can't support you with. It really just depends on what stage the business owner is in. And I'm usually very good at discerning where they're at, what they need, and then we can talk about price points from there. Yeah, I would agree. And I would speak on the brand kit because you did that for me. That was huge for me because I just had been looking at some certain certain things and I sent you like these ideas for some colors and they were all the most basic blend in colors, look like everyone else colors. And you just called me out and you're like, yeah, that works for them. But you're Izzy freaking Chinche. That's, and I, that, I love that. I love that you did that because I got in that. It's so easy to go down that road of like, oh, I just want to do what's like the aesthetic that's in now. It's so lame. It's so lame. It's like, how do I look like everyone else and have nude colors? Like every sit and the fact that you were, you literally told me like, yeah, that's just, no, that could be good for them. Like, I feel like you, I don't know. I love that. That meant a lot to me. That was huge. So thank well, you for doing it. You are Peruvian beauty, and you're like, I like tan. I'm like, mm -mm, no, we're not doing that. Wrong, wrong. And, you know, like I usually, one of the best parts about my job is that I get to help people channel the highest version of themselves mm -hmm. into yeah. their business. And first off, nude, black and white, not even you, not even. And I can tell just by looking at someone what aligns for them. It's one of my innate gifts as a human and you have your own and I have mine, but this is something I am really good at. And if you look at my personal brand, I have like 27 colors because I am outrageous and yeah. I love that about myself and I'm not going to inhibit it. That doesn't mean that my brand translates to somebody else's. It means yes. I am going to push people just the right amount if I think that they need it. Yeah, no, I love it. So if someone's listening, go get a brand kit. So where should they find you? Instagram or, or website? What do you want? Where do you want to send Either them? or. I'm on absolutely everything. Absolutely yeah. everything. You can find me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, my website, Leslie M. Lyon with a Y dot com. Perfect. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully someone's here for themselves and their business. <laughs> what was that? I said, hopefully people will head your way and, and do something smart and get the, the branding that they need. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love that aspect of it. If you're just getting going, if you're in the trenches and you have leads coming in, I would strongly suggest having a lead management that's automated. And that's something that we're setting up for Izzy. That's something that I do for numerous business owners. And it is the unicorn of lead generation management. Yeah. I'll, I'll do, we'll do some posts, some shorts on it. Thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm so grateful for your support. I'm already excited for the next show. Turn on notifications and be on the lookout for my next episode. Also, please share the show with anyone you feel like might benefit from listening to. Thank you for all your love and support. I will see you soon.